starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the reenactment. This photo is extremely unsettling and for a very good reason. If, when you look at this photo, your instincts tell you that the guy in them is creepy, ding ding ding, you're right. This is a photo that features the German serial killer Joachim Kroll. He is known for taking the lives of 14 people, all varying in age. This monster was caught in 1976 and he was discovered when police found out that he had clogged the plumbing in his apartment with remains of one of his victims. How gruesome is that? This photo was taken shortly after he was caught and arrested, and what you're seeing is Kroll reenacting one of his crimes for the police. I get goosebumps just thinking about that. I couldn't imagine being there or being the police officer he's on top of. Talk about terrifying. I'm just glad that they caught him and got him off of the street. In our number 9 spot today we have the Pioneer's Defense. This photo is known as the Pioneer's Defense and man does it ever look creepy. This photo comes from 1937 and it was taken by a Russian photographer named Viktor Bulla. This photo takes place in the Leningrad area which is now known as St. Petersburg which is the second largest city in Russia. The people in this photo were part of a group that was the 1930s Russian equivalent of our Boy Scouts that was called the Young Pioneers. The masks on their faces leaves a very eerie feeling and for a fair reason. These people were doing a military preparation drill which is the reason for the gas masks. This photo was taken during a time when the country was under the dictatorship of Joseph Stalin and the residents were constantly unsure of what was going to happen. The country was already seeing death and people were already frightened just a few years before the start of World War II, and those in this photo felt the need to be prepared for the worst case scenario. In our number 8 spot today we have the net test. This photo comes to us from 1958 and it is quite an interesting one. At a first glance it looks fun, but then when you catch the expression on the person's face and look a little more into it, it really just leaves you with a ton of questions as to what exactly is going on here. It looks like a guy is going on some sort of a roller coaster ride, but what is actually happening is that a prisoner is being used to test safety nets before they were mass produced. Yeah, not the good time we thought it was. This comes from a time where capital punishment was much more widespread throughout the United States and those waiting on death row couldn't just sit around waiting for their day to come. I think it's probably best that we made the switch to crash test dummies and that sort of thing, and this photo just remains as an eerie reminder of the less than great choices that were made in the past. In our number 7 spot today we have a burst of joy. You might be looking at this photo wondering how this extremely joyous photo could hold any dark secrets. Well, this photo won a Pulitzer Prize and for a good reason. This photo was captured by Slava Vetter on March 17, 1973 at the Travis Air Force Base in California. This photo shows United States Air Force Lieutenant Robert L. Sturm and his family. This was taken as he was being reunited with his family after five years of being held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. On October 27, 1967, he was leading a flight of F-105s when he was shot down over Hanoi and held captive until March 14th, 1973. I can't imagine what this must have been like for his family because there was a huge chance that he could have not come home at all. The looks on their faces of course clearly show that this photo is capturing an exceptionally joyful moment. It's just the story behind this moment that leaves us all with that unsettling feeling. In our number 6 spot today we have Ghost Boy. This photo is said to have been taken inside of the infamous Amityville Horror House in 1976. It is said that this creepy vintage photo is still one of the most chilling paranormal photos of all time. Yep, that's right, this photo is said to be of a ghost. After the DeFeo killing, the next owner of the house, George Lutz, swore that the house was haunted and he called in none other than Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever. On one night of the investigations, they set up an automatic camera on the second floor of the house and this photo is said to have been caught then. Some believe that the ghostly face staring back is that of a young John DeFoe who lost his life in this house. I'm not 100% sure either way, but what I am sure of is that if this is actually a photo of a ghost and not a real person, that is ridiculously creepy. In our number 5 spot today we have a UFO report. This is less of a photo and is actually more like a PDF, but I still felt like it applied to today's list. This is a previously classified document from 1963. Although the document still has a ton of information that has been blacked out, the document is the description and report of an unidentified flying object or a UFO encounter. This is said to have taken place over the desert of Nevada and the report was written in detail in order to have a written record of the event. This document is 
said to have been the authentic report from the FBI, which is exactly why some of the details have still been omitted. This might seem like less of a big deal now, as in this day and age, we have declassified video footage of similar kinds of encounters, but for 1963, this was huge. As discussions of alien or extraterrestrial life is a big part of our modern day society, this document shows that these things have been on our minds for many, many years now. In our number four spot today, we have the Apollo 1 prayer. This photo was originally taken and meant to be a sort of lighthearted prank or joke, but it would later turn out to be a chilling image. This photo shows the Apollo 1 crew jokingly praying over a miniature model of their command module. The three men in the photo are Roger Chaffee, Virgil Grissom, and Ed White. To make this story even worse, prior to the test, the three of them had voiced concerns about the amount of flammable material that was on the craft. The fire was determined to have been caused by an electrical fault, and it spread extremely quickly due to combustion nylon material coupled with the high pressure pure oxygen atmosphere in the cabin. They also were unable to be rescued or escape because the plug door hatch couldn't be opened against the internal pressure of the cabin. Before this test, it was believed that since there was no fuel on the rocket, it would be relatively safe, which is exactly why there wasn't more preparedness in case of emergency. Looking back now, this photo is certainly more mysterious than anyone at the time could have ever imagined. In our number three spot today, we have the Hilo Tsunami. This photo comes to us from April 1st, 1946. This is the day when an 8.6 magnitude earthquake hit just off of the coast of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. As we all know, earthquakes can often have after effects, and this one sent shockwaves throughout the Pacific. This led to the formation of an ocean-wide tsunami that had waves reaching up to 13 stories high. This disaster went on to strike Hilo, Hawaii, in what became one of the worst disasters in Hawaiian history. This photo somehow survived the disaster and it captures the terrifying view someone must have had in their last moments. This photo is especially chilling to view just days after the Tonga volcano eruption occurred. The earth and these naturally occurring disasters are absolutely terrifying and powerful and unpredictable. In our number two spot today, we have the shadows. As most of us know, on August 6th, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. This was devastating to the city, and of course we can understand the implications of this. This photo shows what is called a nuclear shadow, and this is just one that could be seen throughout the city. When the bomb detonated 1,900 feet above the center of the city, the explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to spread through everything within 1,600 feet of it. This of course destroyed nearly everything and everyone within a mile of it. The light and heat from the bomb was so powerful that it bleached the exposed surfaces of the city, except as seen here, where an unsuspecting person was shielding the surface with their own body. It is truly such an eerie reminder of the impact that this really had. In our number one spot today, we have the crash. This is one of those photos that was just taken in the right place at the right time, but it shows a very scary situation. A man named Jim Meads is said to have taken this photo in 1962. The story goes that a man named Bob Sowray had mentioned to Jim that he was going to fly this plane, called the Lightning, the following day. Jim took his kids out for a walk that next day and took his camera with him, intending to get a shot of the aircraft as Bob flew it. He wanted to get a photo of his children with the airfield in the background just as the plane was coming into land. They found the spot, they got all set up, just waiting for the plane to return. Turns out that day Bob didn't fly the plane and instead the pilot was actually a man named George Aird who was another test pilot. So George is up in the plane and he realizes that there's trouble. Since I don't know plane language, I'm gonna use this quote from fearoflanding.com, which wrote, quote, whilst carrying out a demonstration flight, there was a fire in the aircraft's reheat zone. Unburnt fuel in the rear fuselage had been ignited by a small crack in the jet pipe and had weakened the tailplane actuator anchorage. This weakened the tailplane control system, which failed with the aircraft at 100 feet on final approach. This led to the plane pitching up aggressively as George came into land. George lost control and he ejected in order to save himself. Luckily, since the nose had pitched up, he had just enough time. The tractor driver in this photo was then 15-year-old Mike Sutterby, who had spent that summer working on this airfield. He wasn't actually posing, he was telling Jim to move since he wasn't supposed to be there before turning to look at what was happening behind him. This is all what led to this photo being snapped and this story surviving all of these years. 
In the end, George was okay, aside from some minor injuries, and while Jim didn't get the photo he set out for that day, he still got quite an interesting one. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have a pile of bones. During the 19th century, bison were hunted so much that they were actually quite close to being extinct, and by the mid-1880s, there were only a few hundred left. Hides were prepared and then shipped off so that they could be made into leather, but usually the bones, or really anything other than the hide, was just left to decay, as it wasn't useful to the hunters. The hunting of bison was so widespread and overwhelming that even the US Army sanctioned and endorsed the slaughter of herds of bison. The federal government was promoting it for a variety of reasons, including to lessen a food and material source for the indigenous peoples. The US government was even paying a bounty for each bison skull, and military commanders were ordering troops to kill bison, not for them to eat, but just so that the indigenous couldn't. That story, coupled with the sheer mass amounts of skulls seen in this photo, is exactly what makes it so exceptionally unsettling. These bones would likely be on their way to become fertilizer. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Great Manta. In 1933, a New York silk manufacturer named A. L. Kahn was on a nice little vacation in Florida when he honestly accidentally caught something remarkable. His anchor line, by mistake, caught onto a giant manta ray. After a struggle and several hours, Kahn was able to get this actually enormous fish ashore. This monster was somewhere between 5,000 to 6,000 pounds and was 20 feet and 5 inches in width. For reference, there are other giant manta rays, but they usually grow to be around 13 to 14 feet wide, not 20 and a half. This photo is showing a taxidermy version of the fish which Khan used to bring around to exhibitions to show off his accidental catch. In an article from the December 10th, 1933 issue of the St. Louis Post Dispatch's Sunday magazine, Khan is quoted as saying, quote, fishing is a lot of fun when you catch the fish. And sometimes it's fun even when you don't but when the fish catches you. In our number 8 spot today, we have the swimsuits. This is a photo that comes to us from the 1920s, and it shows just one of the many extremely important jobs that the quote, beach patrol of the day had. Yes, they went around measuring the length between a woman's knee and the bottom of her swimsuit because God forbid she showed too much leg at the beach. In the 1920s, bathing suits began to become something that went through changes and fads, and of course this evolution to more form-fitting, less material swimwear caused a lot of controversy in the day. There were then strict dress codes implemented at places like resorts and country clubs, and even directors of public beaches had them, thus the beach patrol. There were fines for violations, and sometimes even imprisonment. In the Washington Post in 1907, there was a photo of two women in bathing suits being escorted by an officer with a caption quote, these apologies for skirts endanger the morals of the children. The police must interfere and stop the outrageous proceedings. In most cases, these sorts of rules really only affected the women of the time, and sometimes women were even required to wear stockings under their bathing suits. I'm just saying, with my attitude, I would have not done well in the 1920s. There was even one beach who had a tailor go around and stitch up swimsuits that they felt weren't up to the dress code. In our number 7 spot today, we have the advertisement. This is a photo that comes to us from a time of World War II, and it shows a terrifying ad. The sign reads, These men didn't take their atabrine. And at first, I had absolutely no idea what that was. Turns out, atabrine is the first synthetic form of quinine, which was used by the US military to fight malaria in the South Pacific during the war. It is estimated that as many as two thirds of the troop fell ill with malaria. This sign is said to have been posted outside of a military hospital in New Guinea, and was meant to serve as a warning for those who didn't take the medicine, warning that the skulls on top would be the fate that awaited them. Perhaps a little dark, but creative and likely effective nonetheless. At the very least, the ad is quite clear. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Ferris Wheel of Hate. This is a photo that, honestly, I don't even know what to say about it. It's gross, it's weird, it's upsetting, and it's honestly just so stupid. For a long time, this photo went under the radar as the photographer who took it didn't share it with the paper, but when it resurfaced 65 years later, it spread like wildfire. And for a lot different reasons than it would have back then, thankfully, but it also reveals some of those blind spots in history that we have. This photo comes from April of 1926, and it shows some members of the KKK just enjoying a day at an amusement park with many of them on a fair 
Ferris wheel. I wish this was one of those times where something went horribly wrong and the whole thing came crashing down, but unfortunately that likely isn't what happened on this day, and now we just have this relic that shows us the insane power and influence that this hate group had during this time. While this photo is very dark, it's an important part of history to remember. Also, before we move on, let's just take a second to talk about how stupid they all look. Like, we gotta wear our little matching outfits to the Ferris wheel. In our number five spot today, we have early plastic surgery. This photo, well, rather these two photos side by side, show a man named Walter Yo, and he was the first person to receive the, at the time, advanced plastic surgery procedure called the skin flap. Sounds disgusting. He received this procedure in 1917, and at the time, since it was so advanced, it was only used for very serious things, like for someone who was wounded in battle, which is exactly what had happened to Walter. He was a soldier in the Battle of Jutland during the First World War. Walter was actually a sailor, and he was manning the guns aboard the HMS Warspite, and while doing this, he sustained facial injuries that included the loss of his upper and lower eyelids. In the end, he needed a couple more operations, but he was even able to return to service for a a little while before being medically discharged. After this, he lived his life until he reached the age of 70 years old. In our number four spot today, we have the Hindenburg. This is a photo that was taken during what is now known as the Hindenburg disaster. It is commonly known that blimps, or these kinds of floating airships, use helium in them to float through the air, and it's important to note that this helium isn't the choice because it's the only option, but rather it's one of the safest options because it isn't extremely volatile. Because of a US ban on the exportation of helium at the time, i.e. the Helium Control Act of 1925, although the Hindenburg was designed to use helium because of a lack of it available, on the day of the Hindenburg disaster, the much more flammable hydrogen was used instead. This led to a complete disaster. When the Hindenburg floated off on May 6, 1937, it disastrously caught fire during its flight with 97 people on board. Sadly, due to the fire, there were 35 casualties on board the flight that day. It is an absolutely horrendous situation, but it does teach us all a very valuable lesson. In our number three spot today, we have the falls. This is a photo of Annie Edison Taylor when she was 63 years old in 1901. The barrel she is posing beside is the one that she sealed herself up inside of to then become the first person to survive a trip over Niagara Falls. Why did she do this? Well, for money, of course. Annie was widowed and spent a lot of time bouncing between different jobs, but after having been burned out of her home and losing money that she had invested with a clergyman, she ended up sadly falling on some hard times, and this is what led her to the falls. The barrel she used was custom made, and it was constructed of oak and iron and padded with a mattress. It wasn't exactly easy to get this whole plan set up, and it ended up being delayed several times, mostly because people were afraid to be a part of this mission that was likely sending Annie to her death, and they truly don't blame them at all. On October 24th, 1901, her 63rd birthday, Annie climbed in the barrel with her heart-shaped pillow and was set adrift. The river currents carried the barrel over the Canadian Horseshoe Falls, and rescuers reached her barrel shortly after. She was alive and escaped with little to no injuries aside from a gash on her head. While her survival is great news, it's important to include what Annie had to say about the entire situation after, which was, quote, If it was with my dying breath, I would caution anyone against attempting the feet. I would sooner walk up to the mouth of a cannon knowing it was going to blow me to pieces than make another trip over the falls. So don't try this at home is what she's saying. In our number two spot today we have War is Hell. This is a photo of a soldier that was taken during the Vietnam War. The soldier has a hand scribed note on their helmet that reads quote, War is Hell and I truly cannot even imagine. In 1954 the US entered the war to support South Vietnam against the regime in North Vietnam as well as their allies in the South. This war lasted for two decades and it claimed more than three million lives, mostly those of Vietnamese civilians. There are many, many powerful, disturbing, and unsettling photos from this war, many of which I would consider too graphic to put here on YouTube. There is something about the brightness of the eyes of the soldier that sits in contrast with the rest of this dark photo that really make it stand out. For a while, the identity of this soldier was left a mystery, but after some years, Fran Chafin Morrison revealed that the soldier was her late husband, Larry Wayne Chaffin. Larry served for a year in the 173rd Brigade, beginning in May 1965, and when this 
this photo was taken, he was just 19 years old. He did end up being discharged from the army and was able to return home to his wife. He sadly ended up passing away at the young age of 39, thought to be because of complications due to the exposure to Agent Orange, but his legacy has lived on. There is an incredible photo of his grandson who looks strikingly similar to his grandfather, holding this exact portrait. In our number one spot today, we have the cross. This photo comes to us from 1960 and it shows Martin Luther King Jr. along with his infant son at the time, removing a cross that had been burnt on his front lawn. This photo is important and powerful for quite a few reasons. Firstly, it's just a glimpse into what Mr. King would have dealt with every single day for many years. It is clear by his almost nonchalant look that this isn't something new or surprising. It's also important to note, however, that this look isn't one of acceptance or content or of someone who is unbothered, but instead it's the look of someone who continually chooses to rise above, someone who chooses to remain calm and cool in the face of adversity, the leader of a movement. As a Reddit user, 1945 best year put so well, quote, here he's a father, a man with a family whose lives are being threatened. He isn't hysterical or obviously afraid, and his towering figure literally rooting out the undesirable foe has been done in any number of war propaganda posters, but he's still sympathetic. He deserves the security of knowing that home will be safe for his children like anybody else.